It's Wednesday, October the 21st, 2020. I'm Mike Ryan, and this is Been Up Today. Today, we head to Park City and Utah, where Blake Christian talks tax and entrepreneurs. Tourism globally has been smashed, with two World Heritage listings close by, the Great Barrier Reef and the rainforest of the Daintree and Cape Tribulation, Port Douglas and far north Queensland has been impacted greatly. We catch up with Paul Macon from the local radio station, Fab FM. Today we look at why America produces so many entrepreneurs and how does the tax code encourage entrepreneurs from a policy standpoint. Blake Christian is a tax partner with Holthouse, Carlin and Van Trite. Blake, thanks for joining us and uh, you look much more relaxed today than, uh, than last time. <laughs> Great to be here. Yeah, we just uh, finished our, our last big uh, tax filing deadline. So uh, with COVID and everything else, it was uh, nice to get that behind us. What are some of the uh, key measures of entrepreneurial activity in a country? Well, they, they look to um, how many startups um, started up in a given year. Uh, and also uh, from an intellectual property standpoint, which drives a lot of those new businesses, they look at uh, the patent issuances uh, during a given year. How does the U.S. compare to other countries in these terms? Well, uh, I was just looking at those stats and uh, chi China actually edges us out for volume of, uh, of patents and um, uh, but we're we're a close second, and then uh, but from a uh, you know business friendly standpoint, which is kind of more what I look at, um, uh, the U.S. is um, you know is is much higher up than uh, than China. Why is growth in entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial firms so important? Well, it's it's really um, you know pe people think that big businesses are the driver for job growth and things, but really the statistics show that the small small businesses are really the, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the, the driver of, you know, the economy, new jobs, spending, etc. cetera. So uh, you, to have a healthy economy, you really want to be stimulating uh, those small businesses, which will eventually, you know, some of them will uh, grow into very large businesses. What changes then have been really evident, maybe say in the last five, 10 years? Well, you know, every country's a little different, but uh, you know, they, you know tax, tax law has you know, a fair amount to do with that. Infrastructure, the education system, uh, particularly the university system. And that's, that's why the US is so robust. When you, when you look at business startups, um, you know, by, by a wide margin, the United States is, uh, you know, always the leader. Uh, you have 500, you know, world-class universities, uh, you know, by, by international standards um, that um, are research-oriented. Uh, and the combination of that plus, uh, the, you know, pretty easy access to capital, venture capital, and, um, you know, reasonably... Um, moderate tax structure makes it a you know pretty fertile ground for entrepreneurs. Which aspects of the U.S. tax system favor, say, growth in entrepreneurial activity? Uh, again, they you have a capital gain rate for um, which is lower at a maximum of twenty three point eight percent versus thirty seven for ordinary income, and so there's. Um, you know, there's a benefit to investing money and getting a return in terms of appreciation on stock or, um, you know, intellectual property investment. So uh, that that'll draw money into it. And also on the flip side, if you um, if you lose money, uh, there's capital loss you can claim against other capital gains. Uh, you can write off worthless bad debts if you loaned money. To, um, to a startup company. And so all of those things combined make, you know, make it a, an easier bet to um, invest in these companies because the government effectively 
is paying for some of your loss if you if you do um, have have a loser and and some of the not every company is going to be successful in the long run. Mm. What about the effects of uh, state taxes? Are they significant? Uh, they they are, um, you know, and it's it's not just the state income tax, but it's uh, it's fees, it's um, you know, um, all, all sorts sales tax, um, all all sorts of um, things can add up, and so uh, we are seeing, and, and certainly COVID has highlighted the fact of. Uh, you know, where people are doing business. And so we're seeing a lot of, you know, kind of musical chairs right now of, of businesses um, moving all or part of their operations from some of the higher tax states, which coincidentally are, are often states that are, are being, you know, overly uh, locked down and, and overly regulated. And so, the combination of that plus the high taxes is driving, you know, so, some some people to um, move out of out of the state. Uh, Elon Musk is, you know, moving a, a big chunk of um, of his companies out of uh, California because of that. Yeah, I see that um, California. You often read about, and notably uh, Los Angeles, that they're uh, moving from. Uh, California or LA moving to uh, Texas, a lot of moving to Texas. Um, which I know say, which are the worst for taxes for if you're an entrepreneur, and there were two that or say three states that you said we must not go there, otherwise it becomes really really quite difficult. And which are the the couple that really shine that light says come and visit us, come and set up business here. Yeah. So so on the negative side, you know Cal- California, New York. Um, ironically, are are usually at the bottom of the the business friendly and tax friendly states, and uh, I would say uh, Texas and uh, Nevada are are probably you know the high on most people's list uh, to move to, um, and um, you know other states like Wyoming doesn't have a an income tax. It doesn't have any people. Right. (laughs) But those those aren't really, um, you know, where people are are rushing to, you know, Mm. Californians or people from New York are, uh, you know, still kind of wanting to be in a a little more populous state. Although with COVID and everybody just vacating these uh, these areas such as Los Angeles and uh, uh, New York. Uh, it sort of makes you wonder what's going to happen in the future. Speaking of the future, um, big election about to happen. The uh, the uh, Biden Harris ticket. Uh, will their professed changes affect entrepreneurship? Uh, absolutely, um, and you know also, you know the Trump administration has attracted a lot of uh, foreign investment into the United States by by decreasing uh, the corporate tax rate uh, down to you know, a, a pretty low 21%, which is competitive worldwide. And um, you know, so if, if um, Biden bumps that, that tax rate you know, back into the you know, mid 30s, um, you know, I think you're gonna see, you're certainly gonna see a slowdown of, of international investment into the United States. And um, and you're also going to see, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, pro- probably not, um, you know, not not being quite as active. Uh, so, some of the capital will dry up and, and go to other places. It's uh, pr- pretty, you know, you can can invest worldwide pretty easily these days. International, I mean, trade still may continue um, under Biden with uh, Ukraine, but that's another story. Uh, what what further policy action should be taken to further encourage entrepreneurial risk taking, Blake? Well, w- one of the big, big tax code uh, provisions is the the research and development credit, and uh, that's on both the federal and most states also offer that. On a combined basis, it ends up being around fifteen percent of your incremental. Uh, research and development costs. Uh, it's a, it's really a labor-driven uh, credit, 
Um, and uh, if you outsource your R and D, it's it's only sixty five percent of those costs. But uh, that that's that's also a very attractive um, feature. And you know, I I could see you know if I if I was could wave a magic wand, I'd probably increase that a little bit. Um, we we love uh, the the ability to expense. Um, tangible personal property, desk, chairs, machinery. Uh, you can, under US law, you can deduct most of that in the year of acquisition, uh, even if it's debt financed. So so that's pretty powerful. You could put 20% down on a million dollar piece of property. And if you have other debt to support your tax basis, you could write that full million dollars off in year one. So, um, so there, there's a lot of, uh, very good things in the tax code right now that may be taken away under a, a Biden administration. Or under a Pelosi administration. We we may <laughs> sort of laugh at this, but what a terrible state the U.S. would be in then. Um, yeah, mo- I think most people would feel that way, but there's uh, there's a, um, a a group that would would applaud that. Um, I, I will uh, I, I may be coming over to uh, stay with you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be another political refugee. And by the way, we, you can fly here. It's just, unfortunately, the airfares are expensive and you have to go through about 10 different countries to get here because we have this really big border to this big wall just about around Australia. So um, unless you know somebody here, and by the way, I have no influence, so don't, don't rely on me, you'll probably get locked up. Um, I mean, good luck coming here. But, you know, if you do get, look, we have a spare room. We have a spare room. And um, in fact, we could have because the Gold Coast, by the way, is where we're broadcasting from. It's almost a mini America. We have Miami, Palm Beach, um, uh, uh, Mermaid Beach used to be called Los Angeles. So you would feel pretty comfortable here, too. Well, I'm ready to go. One thing, if I could interject, Mm. is which we haven't touched on is regulation. And, And regulation is just as important as taxes. So you want to pick a country or a state that has moderate, uh, reasonable uh, regulation. And, and that's that's a bigger and bigger issue these days and should always be looked at by entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, great chatting. Uh, once again, uh, your website is hcvt.com. I know that off by a heart. Uh, they just uh, go to the website and, that, and they can find you there. Is that right? That's right. I pre- appreciate uh, always uh, talking to you. Blake Christian from Holthouse, Carlin and Van Trite at hcvt.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fab FM is the local radio station in Port Douglas and the Douglas Shire. Paul and Marion Macon own Fab FM and Paul Macon hosts the Brekkie or Morning Drive show. And Paul, thanks for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure and it's uh, great to be with you. You've done it all. Uh, 5KA in Adelaide, uh, national radio and TV, uh, advertising, and you still seem like a nice guy after that foray into advertising. What was the great attraction for uh, moving up to the country where crocodiles roam free? Well, you left out for a start game show. I did a game show in Perth called $50,000 Letterbox, and that was on nationally before uh, the Wheel of Fortune. But uh, to answer your question about Fab FM, well, we we purchased the license. We were originally negotiating with the owner to buy the license. It wasn't called Fab FM then. It was called just Port Douglas FM. And uh, we couldn't reach an agreement with the owner. But then about oh, maybe three months after those negotiations broke down, it, we were sent an advertisement by some friends up here for the licence uh, being sale uh, on sale from the liquidator. So we put in our bid for it, expression of interest, and eventually uh, acquired the, the licence. And that's how we ended up with a radio station. And I always thought, I always had it in my mind, this because of the Fab Four, and I love the word Fab. Uh, I, you know, it's fabulous and all that. So we kind of went with Fab FM. We did have a couple of listeners call up, however, in the beginning to say, why did you name a radio station after a washing detergent? <laughs> but the, the station itself, it really services the community. Do you see there's a, a clash, though, with tourism and the local issues? For example, tourists, when they come to an area, they want to know what's happening, where to go, what to see, what to do. Uh, with local issues, you have the, the issues with um, 
you know, council, um, a rubbish collection, things of, of, of a local nature? Well, our actual licence uh, through ACMA doesn't really allow us on air to get involved in any local issues as far as controversial issues are concerned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what we do, we we then we're able to do it through what we have as our podcasts here on Fab FM, and so any of those sort of issues we can do on our podcasts, and they've become. I mean, podcasts at the moment are the biggest thing, and the listeners here have taken like a water a duck to a water. They, they just love the podcast, so wow. we're able to do it on podcast, but not necessarily on air. Um, a lot of the the council issues, or, or if the council has to get information across. They use Fab FM for their advertising to get those. For, for example, we're on water restrictions, number one water restrictions at the moment. So they're able to get ads on that way. But but ACMA, our licence doesn't allow us to do talk back or do any of those local issues. It's only to play the music that we play and talk about that. Do you find that's restrictive at all? Uh, it can be a little bit restrictive, uh, and, and it was initially, but we we're able to work with ACMA to uh, to do the podcasts, and those social media podcasts, uh, they don't come under ACMA, so we're able to handle issues, do interviews with the mayor, do interviews with people who are unhappy with the council or happy with the council or, or tackle those local issues without sort of uh, getting into license issues. Radio stations, particularly the uh, the local stations, really are a great gauge for the temperature of the uh, of business. How is business at the moment uh, in Port Douglas and the surrounding areas because of COVID? Well, it's pretty well non-existent. I mean, for example, Port Douglas relies on tourism heavily. I mean, it's a tourist town. Mossman relies on sugar, and of course, that's going okay, and the sugar mill, and so that side is doing okay. But the this side where the station is, we're at the marina here, we're on the railway station at the marina where the cane train leaves from in, in tourist times. Very badly affected. I mean, it, it, sometimes you can look down our main street, Macrossan Street, and fire a shotgun. At other times, you can see a lot of people, and this depends on holidays, school holidays at the moment where people can get away. But what we are finding is that Queenslanders are travelling. And we're getting so, when they come past the window and give me a wave, I always go out to say hello. And people from Townsville, Rocky, and uh, and all places south uh, in Queensland, all coming to holiday up this part of the world. Now, they may not have chosen us initially. They might have been going to another state or overseas. But because of COVID, they've picked us. So within the state, the tourism has picked up. But uh, as far as other people, you know, other tourists travelling from around Australia, particularly Victoria, this place, uh, some people have told me that 60% of our tourists come from Victoria. And that is a massive amount. And with, uh, with COVID locking down Victoria, or Daniel Andrews locking down Victoria, uh, those people aren't coming up. So, look, we're, to answer your question, we are affected so badly at the moment, uh, re-tourism and COVID. What about international travellers too? Uh, that's some way off because... We can't travel because we might get sick. Uh, how, do, how do you feel, or how do you feel that the operators will survive? Say, if you take into account uh, Victoria, which is uh, still up in the air, uh, we have Queensland. Uh, an election is about to happen, so who knows what's going to happen to the borders? You have the general fear of the community still, because governments are great at creating fear, uh, not so good at. <laughs> alleviating that that fear of fear. So, how do you see businesses, uh, maybe in the next, um, you know, for the next say six twelve months, uh, coping? Well, you've, you've you've made some good points there, and I mean, uh, the the Palaszczuk government up here has uh, kept the border closed for political reasons. I mean, everybody knows that. I mean, they're going to open the border to New South Wales completely on November first, one day after the election. They're also not allowing New Zealand travellers in, uh, whereas other states are. So, you know, Queensland is just shut off to just about everybody, apart from a few uh, people in the northern part of New South Wales. So, you know, we're we're in terrible strife. And and to keep it closed like this, a lot of people are very, very upset about it. I mean, I think think the border should have been open weeks and weeks ago. Uh, to New South Wales, not to Victoria. We understand the the Victorian situation, but it should have been open in New South Wales weeks ago, and yet it is still closed to people from New South Wales. We could have had all of New South Wales, people from Sydney and all over New South Wales coming up, 
to this part of the world visiting Port Douglas and boosting our economy and we haven't got it. So, you know, for political reasons, I mean, our political masters just have us in the vice. They have the set in the vice and they're squeezing it. What's the word, um, say, in the tourist industry in regards to November 1 when the borders come down? Uh, will there be a, a great influx of bookings for, uh, for Port Douglas and the surrounding areas? Oh, everybody feels that, and I certainly feel it. And I think because we've moved into the area, we're not locals. Uh, well, we are locals. I mean, I always say if, you, if you're living here, you're a local. But we're not long-term locals. And, you know, the people up here may be a bit pessimistic about it. I feel like so many businesses that once the Queensland border is open, there will be a rush of people, particularly from New South Wales, coming in. I mean, we're already getting lots of people from South Australia. I had some South Australian tourists up here uh, who sort of wade through the window. Oh, there's Paul, you know, because they know me from Adelaide. And I went out and had a chat to them and they said, oh, you know, as soon as we were going to go overseas, we mm. had these overseas plans. But as soon as we were allowed to come up to see you, we hopped on the plane and came up straight away. So I think there's going to be a huge influx. The businesses feel that. I certainly feel that. And I think we're going to how our tourism is going to go the, through the roof. And particularly when Victoria settles down and when Victoria opens, get ready. And I think... But it's just a matter of, uh, and I think probably you'll ask me the question about small and large businesses, mm. but I think some of the smaller ones won't survive, but the bigger ones will. Is it like the, uh, the uh, uh, recession that we had to have sort of rings a bell from the 90s? You and I can probably recall that. A lot of our audience can't, uh, which is a bit scary as you get older. Uh, but is this, you know, some politicians that, you know, actually a lot of the, uh, the, the left is saying, well, business will just start up anyway they'll just you know build it and they will come and that's not the case is it well it isn't and uh when you're mentioning the left you're mentioning uh, some governments the palaszczuk government the andrews government i mean these people you know it always makes me laugh when i see chairman dan say uh oh look we're all in this together no we're not he's not in it with us um he's still drawing a massive salary so are the public servants they're not without a job but there are people who uh, are doing it hard without jobs. I mean, the job keeper and job seeker, absolutely. Without that, they mm. were stuck. But I mean, it's all right for them to say, oh, we're all in this together, you know, blah, blah, blah. We've got to... But then we're not in it together. The, the public are not in it together. There's so many people out of work. There's so many people doing it hard. There are businesses going to the wall. And before this is over, there'll be more businesses go to the wall and, and up here as well. Some will survive. Uh, I mean, us as a business, if I can quickly tell you, we had some wonderful advertisers and that's our only income is advertising. And we have wonderful advertisers that came on board when we first came up here uh, two years ago, exactly two years ago. And when COVID hit in March, we said to our advertisers for three months, free of charge advertising, we're not going to charge you one penny wow. for advertising for three months. Then after three months, we'll reevaluate it and only charge you a, a percentage, you know, 20% or something of your normal until you can get back into business. All of those businesses came back on board with us and all of those businesses has survived. So I think it's up to every single person to help the, your neighbour during this. But don't tell me governments are in the same boat as us. Those, the federal government, the, the state governments, they're all drawing massive salaries and public servants making decisions, health officials making decisions on behalf of us. They're not in the same boat as us. They're mm. in a very, very different boat. What about with the election? Uh, what's the region being promised by the major parties during this campaign? And uh, any proposals there that really get you excited, Paul? Well, both parties uh, and, the, and uh, of course, the independents are promising jobs, jobs, jobs and more jobs. Now, what does that mean? I mean, you know, it's, it's gobbledygook. Uh, the government themselves, I mean, the particular government up here, the Palaszczuk government, they haven't even released a budget. So we don't even know how much money's in the coffers. So how are they going to get jobs, jobs, jobs and infrastructure? We don't know how much is in the bank. And the, uh, the opposition is the same. They, they, they're going blind as well because they don't know how mm. much money's in the, in the bank with the government. So it's all over the joint. As far as other industries are concerned, I was just talking to a guy the other day who's now going into looking at growing coffee uh, oh. in, in a cooler part of this region, mm. Gr growing coffee and turmeric, uh, because, you know, these are things that uh, around the world they have a shortage of. And he's looking at things around here 
that um, there's a world shortage of and looking to see whether we can grow that in our region. Now, that might sound small potatoes uh, or small coffee beans, but it's, it's, it's a mindset that people, you know, thinking outside the square. And that's what a lot of businesses are doing now. Some of the farmers are getting out of sugarcane and saying, what can we grow so that when this is over and, the, and you know, the world is looking for a particular product, mm. can we supply them? Can we think outside the square? Can we get new businesses into the Douglas Shire as we are into the region? So I think what COVID-19 done, it, it, it's done two things, I think. One, well, certainly one, it's, well, maybe three things. It's made us appreciate our friends and how much we miss our friends and family. It's made us think about what other things we can do in business and how to survive, right? And it's also taught us to wash our hands and to keep our hands clean. And, and the, uh, the generation of kids now are learning to be much cleaner than they used to be. I think, in fact, all of us. Mm. I mean, I've got two lots of hand sanitizer in here. I use it every single day in and out. Mm. Uh, I never used to do that before. I'd use it occasionally and wash my hands. I'm a pretty clean bloke. But hasn't it taught us that? So mm. there's many lessons have come out of COVID-19. And let's face it, we will get through this. It's not World War II. Those people in Australia and around the world faced uh, worse hardships than we ever did, and you know, compared to World War II. So, yes, we are uh, involved in a war, but we'll get through it. And I think we'll be better for it. Assuming that the borders reopen, that we have the imaginary wall down, um, and somebody is looking for a, um, a, a couple of hour flight for either from Brisbane or from um, Sydney or Melbourne, and uh, or even maybe some of the New Zealanders are here and uh, they're thinking about say, seeing part of Australia. Sell us Port Douglas. Why? I mean, we're going up there at Christmas because we're going to sit by the pool and and sip some nice shardies and um, see the beautiful Dane tree and you know, all sorts of things. But how would you sell it to someone that's sort of thinking about moving or going to the uh, to Port Douglas for a couple of weeks? Well, it's unique. And, and I know that word is overused a mm. lot, but this place is unique. One of the great things that I found when I was a tourist before we moved up here to start a business up here, the radio station, was that when you get to Port Douglas, you go to other places, it takes you, particularly if you're in the media, and I was in a pretty high-pressure media mm. job before I left, you know, doing investigative journalism and, you know, sometimes your head, it's spinning. <laughs> I would come up here and within 24 hours, I was relaxed. It has a zen feeling. So Port Douglas still has the village feel and a very zen thing about it. Mm -hmm. Across the river to the Daintree, a lot of people, it's amazing how many people think that if you're in Port Douglas to get to the Daintree, it's going to take days and days to get into the Daintree. You can do it in one day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I recommend you take more, but you can actually hop in your car, drive to Cape Tribulation through the Daintree, have lunch in the Daintree, and come back here to Port Douglas in one day and do it easily and be back, uh, you know, mm. four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So what I say to you is it is unique. We're on the doorstep of the Great Barrier Reef, one of the great uh, treasures of our planet. And the Daintree itself, which is absolutely magnificent. And I've got to know some of the locals up there. So when you do come up or whenever I invite people up here, I can tell you where there's some great swimming holes where you don't have to worry about crocs. The water is crystal clear and you will relax. And I think that is unique, relaxation, discovery. The three great things mm. that we have in this area. Fantastic. We're very similar. We're on the Gold Coast uh, broadcasting and the, um, we have some old crocs here, but generally they're in wheelchairs <laughs> and we've got walking sticks. <laughs> that'll uh, get back, by the way, that'll get back. But you also, do you still have the meter maids? Uh, no, they've gone. I mean, oh, much, to my, would... much to my horror, let me tell you. The they wouldn't be PC now. <laughs> Actually, not much is. And that, that's another conversation that you and I could more or less hey. let loose on. Hey, uh, somebody wants to hear Fab FM. How would they do that? Say, so besides well, being in Port Douglas? Well, you just go on your phone. Uh, you go on your phone to any of the radio apps, mm -hmm. My Tuner or, you know, My Radio app or whatever, and you just put in Fab FM Port Douglas and it'll pop up and you put your app on there. We've got many people who listen in on the app and we've even got people overseas, Canada and other places that uh, 
listen in to the program so you can get it there. And, and in fact, when we came up from Adelaide, we packed everything in our vehicle and came up to Adel uh, from Adelaide to here. We listened to Fab FM on automation all the way up. So it was very good. Well, the uh, and just I mean, you, you play country, which is not one of my favourite formats, but it's huge demand, especially up north. And I've got to say, I was really impressed with the story that I heard that Willie Nelson wrote a song about you. Yes, it's a song called Me and Paul. Um, and and uh, I, I stick to the story that Willie and I travelled around America and uh, wouldn't look on planes because they mm. checked what we were uh, having a smoke of and all of that sort of stuff. And that's the story I tell my listeners. Now, if they are that gullible to believe that, oh, I, have some, I have some swamp land up in the Cape York that I'd need to talk to them about. Why, why let the truth stand in the road of a good story? That's what I say. You've got it. See, all that training in the media hasn't gone to waste. Paul, it's been a pleasure. We've got to do this more often because I think Port, Port Douglas and up north is, and Queensland, in fact, is one of the great states of Australia. You have, I mean, you would have been uh, like, like myself. I felt that Queensland was it's almost like a secret because just back in Sydney or Adelaide or Melbourne, you sort of think, oh, a nice place for a holiday, but to live. But once you move to Queensland and where you are, it just opens the eyes and you can feel yourself starting to live again, can't you? You can. It, as I said, the relaxation, the zen of this place. So we look forward to seeing you up here. And by the way, just a little bit of country music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Paul Macon, uh, great chatting, poor taste in music, but I still love it. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody, and just a treat to talk with you today. And that's it for BNAP Today, Wednesday, October 21, 2020. I'm Mike Ryan.